Influence Continuum. This is a podcast all about influence, not just destructive influence like the ones we see in cults, but also the ethical, healthy side of influence. I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan with another episode of the Influence Continuum, and I'm absolutely delighted to have a colleague and friend uh, do another interview with me, but this time for the interview um, for the Influence Continuum, and I'm going to just read your bio. Daniel Shore, LCSW, which is Licensed Social Worker, is a psychoanalyst in private practice in New York City and in Nyack, New York. Originally trained as an actor at Northwestern University and with the renowned teacher Uta Hagen in New York City, Shaw later worked as a missionary for an Indian guru. His eventual recognition of cultic aspects of this organization led him to become an outspoken activist in support of individuals and families traumatically abused in cults. Simultaneous with leaving this group, Shaw began his training in the mental health profession, becoming a faculty member and supervisor at the National Institute for the Psychotherapies in New York. Shaw is a sought-after teacher and speaker. In addition to his many conference presentations and published journal articles and book chapters, In 2014, Shaw's book, Traumatic Narcissism, Relational Systems of Subjugation, was published for the Relational Perspective series by Rutledge and was nominated for the Distinguished Gradiva Award. In 2018, the International Cultic Studies Association awarded him with the Margaret Thaler Singer Award for advancing the understanding of coercive persuasion and undue influence. Shaw's second book, the topic of today's interview, is Traumatic Narcissism and Recovery, Leaving the Prison of Shame and Fear, and it was published in Rutledge in 2021. Uh, Dan, thanks so much for joining me in stellar work, and as, uh, as a colleague who has been helping educate clinicians, but also the planet, about the predatory nature of cult leaders and traumatic narcissists, I really want to offer you this platform to share what what you think people need to know about about this topic, because it seems to be epidemic to me, Dan. Yeah, epidemic is the right word. And Steve, I have to first uh, remind you, I think I've told you before, that when I left City Yoga, uh, at S-I-D-D-H-A, Siddha Yoga, uh, in 1994, I thought I was just going to put it all behind me and move on. I had started grad school at that point. And about a year later, I picked up your book, the first one, Com- Combating Cult Mind Control. And it was reading that book that really um, made me realize how seriously I needed to take my experience and what had happened and I needed to do something about it. And that is when I began to speak out Mm. uh, about city yoga with other former members and also uh, really begin to recognize how serious the uh, issue of traumatic abuse and cults really is. Yeah. And I had to work with, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was just going to say, I've worked with people in Siddha Yoga. That's Muktananda was the first guru. And then Guru Mai took over and actually kidnapped her own brother so she could have the crown, if I remember correctly. And I was part of an intervention that led to an expose, which led to a New Yorker article. 
And That's I right. was uh, uh, interacting with another former member of your group who had a website up, uh, Leaving City Yoga, which I believe you've now taken over many years ago. That's right. Yes, yes. He uh, he had tried to make that website interactive, and the cult apologists were just so vicious that he burned out and asked me to take over. So mm. it's, it remains online as a, a, a repository of anybody's account uh, stories, media articles about the group, and I think it's helped deter a lot of people from getting involved, which is... Yeah, and, and I want to add, just for a cultural touchstone, a lot of people have heard of Eat, Pray, Love, or seen yeah. the movie, and it was Guru Mai who was the guru, although I think it was uh, backpedaled or ignored uh, for, for obvious reasons. Yeah. I think um, the author, Elizabeth Gilbert, did not actually meet Guru Mai. She was not in India when L Elizabeth Gilbert was staying at that ashram. And I, I think uh, once Gilbert knew the history of Siddha Yoga, she began to distance herself. Interesting. Well, that's wise. But let me just say you were you were on staff and you traveled around and helped, you know, recruitment and PR and such. So you were an insider who had direct uh, you were meeting with her, I believe, regularly to discuss business. That's right. So it's a That's big right. deal especially for you. In the especially in the last few years, it was 13 years altogether. But those last few years mm -hmm. is when I actually had direct contact with Guru Mai on more or less daily basis. Right. So, uh, you know, my heart is people who are whistleblowers, who are in the inside, who got to meet with the cult leaders, have a very unique perspective. And for those of us who, like yourself who've gone on to become clinicians to help others, it really becomes a reservoir of, of uh, potential resources to help our clients because we get to dip into our personal stories and our own healing journeys so our clients don't feel like we're talking down to them or like the m biggest complaint I hear all the time from former members is, Steve, I've been in therapy for years and I'm tired of teaching my therapist about right. what it is to be like, you know, coming out of a cult. And yep. that's partly why I was motivated to create this online course to at least give a foundational understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about undue influence and mind control and brainwashing. Well, that is also what motivated me uh, to write the two books I've written and to develop the concept of the traumatizing narcissist, which I, I refer to more specifically as uh, the relation, no, the traumatizing narcissist's mm -hmm. relational system of subjugation. So I'm trying to make clear in that phrase that there is a type of person that I would call a traumatizing narcissist because that describes a very specific set of behaviors yep. and psychological orientation. And that person creates a relational system with others uh, for the perp which is predatory, and it's for the purpose of subjugating and exploiting others, mm -hmm. whether that's one individual or a group or, by the way, a nation, mm -hmm. which obviously is an issue both of us are interested in and which you wrote about extensively in The Cult of yeah, Trump. Yeah, Cult of Trump and Xi of China and Putin of Russia and Bolsonaro of Brazil, etc. Exactly. Yep. So can I interrupt for a second and just say, so in the cult of Trump, and I remember interviewing you, and, and the interview is on my freedomofmind.com website about Trump and malignant narcissism. So yeah. when you talk about a traumatizing narcissist, is it you're pretty much talking about a malignant narcissist, the classic narcissism plus the person who thinks they're above the law and is a pathological liar and shaming and paranoid, etc. Yes, there's a uh, there's a, a a concept called the dark triad. And people whose psychology is organized in the dark triad are malignant narcissists plus 
sociopaths plus Machiavellian, meaning that for them the end always justifies the means. Hmm. So that combination of narcissism, sociopathy, and uh, Machiavellianism uh, is really, um, I think, what we mean when we talk about the malignant narcissist, a phrase uh, that I believe Eric Fromm yes. coined. Yep. And, um, and he really was talking about Hitler, Stalin, Nero, Caligula. He was talking <laughs> about Right. The, the the historical tyrants. Right. And, uh, of course, we have them in current times. And Trump has certainly aspired to be this kind of a tyrant. He's That's that's his whole agenda, as, as far as I can see. Yep. And we see it with Putin and so on, as you mentioned. Right. So please unpack the, the key concepts, because, honestly, I just refreshed my memory of your great work in some podcasts and, and lectures you've given me. And I just think it's so brilliant and so important, especially for people, I think, coming out of guru type cults. But I'll add like New Apostolic Reformation, even though it's Christian, quote unquote, they look to yes. the prophet, to the leader as a prophet or an apostle who has direct revelation of God. So it's a Christianized version of guru worship. So I think it Absolutely. still completely applies to what we're dealing with today. Right. Well, well, thank you. I, I appreciate your uh, your uh, interest in the, in the concept. And. I developed the concept this way, Steve. I was, I had left the cult. I was sitting in a pool of shame and some fear as well. And uh, I had to figure out what, how to help myself. And, you know, uh, I was in therapy and I had decent therapists, but they were not cult educated uh, people. Mm -hmm. But they were quite good anyway, and I was, I'm grateful for that. But the thing that I kept realizing was that it wasn't hard for me to understand what vulnerabilities had led me to get involved. It wasn't hard for me to understand how I got stuck in it and couldn't get out. It, what, all of those things seemed to me fairly um, easy to access. What was baffling was the psychology of the cult leader. What what would make a person treat others in the way I had been treated in the, way, in the ways that I had seen so many others treated? And by this time, I was talking to many other people who had been in cults, not just the one I was in. And so that's what led me to want to develop a concept to understand the psychology of the cult leader. And the first... Uh, the first part of that for me was narcissism. Now, I believe up until the time I started really talking about narcissism and cult leaders, uh, in the field, I think what we were mostly thinking about was sociopathy, people who believe themselves to be above the law and who had no conscience and no empathy, so mm -hmm. on. The reason narcissism was important to me was because I, I believe that these um, figures, political, religious, uh, and in many other arenas, by the way. And just to make the point uh, also that, you know, this can be one-on-one -on -one situations as well as national situations. Absolutely. You know I deal with a lot yeah. of one-on-one -on -one mind control yeah. things now. Absolutely. So the psychology of the person alien, preying upon others, uh, exploiting others, subjugating others was what I wanted to get at. And for me, it boils down to a few ideas. I, I try not to overcomplicate it. Of course, my books are more detailed. But the basic idea is that this is a person who has developed a delusion of omnipotence. And by omnipotence, I would, I'm talking about a sense of ultimate superiority, ultimate entitlement, Ultimate, um, you know, entitlement to have no boundaries, to violate any other boundaries, any other person's boundaries, any kind of boundary. And that delusion of omnipotence, I 
believe exists because that person has to compensate for something profoundly disorganized, unstable, and and really broken internally. That person, uh, you know, one of the things I often say is that um, cult leaders are the neediest persons in the world. They are the most needy of any kind of human being. And yet they position themselves as people who need nothing from anybody, and they hold the delusion in, in, uh, of their own complete, absolute, self-contained perfection, mm-hmm. right? Yep. That It's important to me in helping people break free of these relationships in which they have become intimidated, in which they've been belittled and humiliated over and over again, in the same way that um, domestic violence works with battering. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of psychological battering that the traumatizing narcissist employs in order to be able to just control and exploit people. The truth is, the narcissist needs that person desperately to prove to themselves how powerful they are, you know, to prove their delusion of omnipotence. They're, they're, they're constantly needing to prove to themselves that they are what they have deluded themselves into believing. I am shameless. I need nobody. I'm superior and therefore entitled. There's no boundaries that apply to me. Mm-hmm. This, mm-hmm. Is a, this is a profound delusion based on what they had to do to overcome their own terror, their own shame. I, if you, uh, because I of their you own notice. child rearing, is that what you're saying? I think you know that, Steve, right? The biography well, I want my of listeners cult to know it, buddy. <laughs> yes, the biographies of these cult leaders always involve how profoundly humiliated they were growing up. Mm-hmm. A good example, of course, is Donald Trump, and Mary Trump can tell us all about that. But another great example is um, uh, from Robert J. Lifton's book on Shoko Asahara. Mm-hmm. Asahara was a disabled child in poverty, taunted and humiliated by his school peers. And he grew up to be a cult leader who controlled uh, a, a large amount of very intelligent, middle class, educated people and led them to try to destroy the world. Yeah, so I just want to add, if I may, Lifton's book is Please. called Destroying the World to Save It. And Shoko Asahara, I know that cult well because 60 Minutes flew me to Japan after the sarin gas attack and the subways. Yes. yes. And he claimed to be Jesus and Buddha. And he, uh, you're correct, he didn't do well in school. And so it's all about trying to compensate for a lack of love and attention to build a healthy yes. self in early life. But I believe most of these people have actually been quite abused mm-hmm. and belittled and humiliated. And mm-hmm. it's this overcoming of shame by adopting shamelessness. Hmm. which is one of the main features I see in the traumatizing narcissist. Now, the reason I I decided to go with traumatizing narcissists is because a lot of people are narcissistic to one degree or another. They might be self-referential. They might tend to um, always refer back to themselves. They might tend to show off or um, think they know better than others. It doesn't mean that these are bad people. These people are often people with a good heart, who are capable of empathy, who can be loving and generous. So when you say somebody's a little narcissistic, it's not. It's one thing to say they're full of themselves. Okay, okay, those people are not toxic necessarily. Yeah, but. The traumatizing narcissist specifically traumatizes other people by destroying that person's sense of their own subjective value and mm-hmm. worth as a human being. Yep. They, they lead others to believe that their only value is in what they're able to give to the narcissist. Right. So the narcissist is like a parasite who sets up a system of extracting everything from other people that uh, then they cannot have, they cannot use their own strength 
or their own love, they have to, they have to, uh, what's the word in the MLMs? They have to uh, send it upline. up the pyramid. Yeah. They have to upline yeah. all of their own worth and value, their love, their talent, their intelligence. They have to upline all of it. And yep. nothing really comes back down because they're kept in constant fear that if they're not sending more up, they're going to get the boot. Yep, exactly. Right. If, so I can, if I can add you know, or just connect please. the dots for my listeners. So what I, I just heard you say a moment ago is that narcissism is on a continuum and there's yeah. lots of folks who are closer to the healthy side where they can have humor and they can feel for other people, but they're still full of yes. themselves and not a healthy, right. great way. But then the extreme continuum where cult leaders lie, which is where we really connect the dots with these very exactly. dangerous, sadistic, paranoid uh, people. And, That's and right. I, I think you're spot on in saying that the, the cult leader needs the followers in some ways more than the cult leader needs any particular follower. Please share more. Well, followers are vulnerable. Most people who get involved, uh, you know, as you know, are at a point of vulnerability in, in, of one sort or another in their life. They are often idealistic people who would like to consider that what they're doing is meaningful or purposeful. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for some way to, you know, actualize or realize those potentials in themselves. And, you know, cult leaders prey upon those people. And if you happen to be exposed at a vulnerable point in your life to the sort of charisma of the cult leader, then this might be what hooks you in. And uh, it's a sort of a self-sealing system. The deeper you go in, the harder it is to have any objective sense of the reality of who you're dealing with. And, um, you know, at the more you, in, in other words, the more you invest, the less likely you want to you are to want to cut your losses, mm -hmm. you want to keep investing more. And you're told in almost every cult, certainly this was true in Nexium. Uh, Nexium, uh, Ken Re Keith Ranieri, the guy who's in jail for 120 years for trafficking. I mean, that was a great example, but it's typical of every cult that um, your doubts and fears mean that you need to invest more, not that you need to pay attention to your doubts and fears. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, you invest and you invest. All right, pause. I may have to ask your editor to edit this piece because uh, the train here is... Um, okay. I'm losing a train for a second on okay. uh, so your let me question. Clap. So can, can I just uh, jump in and ask you a question as a therapist? So my sense in the people that I've worked with over the decades is that there are definitely situational vulnerabilities, death of a loved yeah. one, breakup of a relationship, illness, moving to a city, state, or country. But I've also noticed that there's a disproportionately high number of my clients who had a narcissistic mother or father or somebody early in their life. And I was exposed to Harville Hendricks getting, you know, uh, getting the love you want. And his thesis was that we're looking for partners who can help heal our wounds from our childhood. And you have a you know, deep understanding of, of psychoanalytic, psychodynamic theory. Could you share what you th think about that? Right. Well, I agree that that absolutely constitutes a, a segment of the population of people who become vulnerable to cult uh, influence. But I, I have to say that I don't know that it's, in my experience, the preponderance. Okay. Um, because um, uh, there are, I think there are many people who, um, who had difficulties in their families that did not involve a traumatizing narcissistic parent those difficulties you mentioned situational things the alcoholism the death of a parent early loss uh, situations mm -hmm. sibling uh difference 
Yeah. You know, a mentally ill sibling or something like that. There are many um, family situations that lead people to hold certain kinds of insecurities. Mm -hmm. And what I really believe is that every human being, no matter how good the family, holds a certain reservoir of insecurities that can be triggered and that can also be preyed upon. I agree. And I think this is right. So yep. I, I think that really is how I understand who gets involved. The um, there's definitely the case of those with already that kind of narcissist parent. There's no question of that. But and that may also very much apply to people born and raised in groups mm -hmm. whose parents are completely. Um, you know, dedicated to the guru or the leader and who, who believe that they can just, you know, ignore and abandon and neglect their child because the child is in the community and nobody needs to take, you know, the child is taken care of by the guru, not by the parent. In fact, I see that as a profound, you know, I feel empathy for the parents who are victims of the leader, but then they go on to victimize their children uh, at right. the leader's uh, behest, basically. Right, exactly. And um, I, I, I want to just share something in my own journey, my own healing yeah. journey, because I want to take advantage of your expertise. So as I was trying to deconstruct my Mooney cult identity, uh, and I was exposed to parts theory and IFS, internal family systems theory, psychosynthesis, etc. I started yes. thinking about my child parts that were used to form my Mooney identity. And what I came up with was a universal with every person, which is we all had a moment where we realized our parents weren't omnipotent. They, they couldn't keep us safe all the time or know how to take care of us properly all the time. And there was a profound disillusionment <laughs> in mm. everybody. I mean, there were yeah. other parts of my childhood, like I was very, you know, conservative Jewish going to shul, and I got disillusioned with that. And the Moonies captured that spiritual child part. There was a part of me who was very anti-Nazi, and, you know, we need to go to war, who then... When mm. I became old enough to know about the Vietnam War and realize war is bad and people are dying for no reason. That was a warrior part of me that I abandoned. But the Mooney is kind of like got to those elements of my psyche and, and used them. Uh, to mm -hmm. to form this Mooney identity. And and why I'm mentioning this to you is just because I, I realize when I'm doing intensives with clients, I often find it important to share this idea and encourage people to think about what were the parts of them that form their cult identity and how can we give those parts a healthier choice? <laughs> like... Fighting cults was my warrior part <laughs> and reconnecting with a very um, renewal form of Judaism, not do dogmatic and doctrinaire, etc. And, and, and finding communities that are healthy. So I, I just wanted to share that man to man, therapist to therapist, former member to former member. Um, and ask your comments. What do you think? Well, I think that uh, I have similar, very similar ways of understanding, and and mm. my own experience is very similar in terms of working through my own vulnerabilities that led to my involvement. Mm -hmm. And there were specific situations, and there were um, problems in my family. But uh, in my in my upbringing. Um, I was I was brought up in a very progressive kind of socialist secular Jewish home. It was not mm -hmm. re I, we were not religious. Um, there was a lot of art and culture and music that we all loved and shared. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I I had uh, specific developmental issues that were personal to me that. Mm -hmm. uh, led to a lot of vulnerability around my sense of security in the world. Mm -hmm. And when I entered City Yoga, 
uh, my insecurities were at 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 their peak. Mm. I'll just put it that way. Uh-huh. If I had if uh, and I had sought psychotherapy and it was very inadequate the mm-hmm. treatment I got. Mm-hmm. And it was shortly after ending psychotherapy that I got involved in the cult, mm-hmm. uh, mainly because, and this this is what's hard for a lot of people to understand, and I think it's relevant to everything we're talking about in, uh, at, at every level, from the micro level with person to person to people involved in QAnon and Trump. Yep. Um, you know, initially... Becoming a member of these communities feels uplifting. Mm -hmm. It feels as though you now have a purpose and a mission that matters. It feels as though you're part of a group of people who believe similarly that uh, that we're doing something that is important, that matters, and that actually is for the good. So in my case, it was, we're going to teach meditation to the world, and everybody's going to benefit from that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for QAnon people, they're going, to, they're going to end pedophilia. They're going to end uh, immorality or whatever. And, uh, you know, they really believe it. And if, and if you're following Trump, and, uh, you know, you're going to... Um, Aside from all the QAnon-based theories around the, the international cabal of pedophiles and so on, anti-Semitic, now being, I might add, now too. being directly linked to Jews specifically. Yeah, it always was, uh, in my opinion. Always was, and here it is now, you know, quiet part out loud. Um, people really believe that they're fighting evil. Yep. And uh, every cult has to, uh, the, in every cult, you become involved in a mission to fight the evil. And what is that evil? The evil is the exposure of the cult leader as a psychopath, as a traumatizing <laughs> narcissist. The evil that you're fighting, whether you know it or not, is to try to protect the cult leader from exposure. The cult leader is... is um, person with a delusional psychosis of omnipotence who is often behaving in a criminal manner because they believe they are entitled to violate any and all boundaries. Right. And what are what's the real mission of any cult? Protect the leader from exposure and support the leader's self-aggrandizement. That's the that's always the only mission. I you would add you're, you're power, gonna, money and sex is in there too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But protection exactly. also, so, but power, power, money, and sex. Exactly. And and that's what's so sad is that many, many people have been, uh, I mean, you and I have both talked to people whose lives have been completely shattered because a spouse or an adult child or a parent has gone gotten completely lost in one kind of cult or another. During the pandemic, Steve, I never had as many calls about family members getting lost uh, down the QAnon, QAnon rabbit holes. Yep. I, 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 I honestly was getting two or three calls a day for almost the first year of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. It was astonishing. And, um, you know, that, that situation in our, in our um, sociocultural picture right now, I think has has led to much of uh, what we're seeing, the apocalyptic kind of thinking. Yeah, the pandemic speeded up what was already happening, and I'm actually spending a lot of time researching the effects of the Internet on people's yeah. minds. And in fact, I'm interviewing a psychiatrist who's done a wonderful book called Rewired about how the mm-hmm. Internet has been co-opted by all kinds of authoritarian forces to make yep. p- more power, money, and sex and elect who they want to elect to un- undermine regulations to protect the climate and to protect women's rights and gay rights and so many yeah. other progressive causes. It's, it's a war between the authoritarian billionaires who want to keep it and don't care about the future of the, the planet Earth, much less starving people who are scraping by. So there's just a huge 
huge vulnerability. I want, I really want to talk about your new book. Um, and you. for the people who are going to uh, look at the video, there it is, Traumatic Narcissism yeah. and Recovery, Leaving the Prison Absolutely. of Shame and Fear, Daniel Shore, Rutless Press. And it's available, correct? It is on all the, all the websites. Yeah. Right. And you know, I, I give, use give me your plug for your website right here, and we'll do it again at the end. Oh, sure. Well, my website is DanielShawLCSW.com. Uh, the books are available on all the bookselling sites, Great. including Rutledge's site, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Great. so on. And the new book, by the way, has this illustration since I have... Uh -huh. uh, shown that this is uh, Albert Durer's picture of the night death and the devil I read about it in uh, a book uh, called The Courage to Be which is by a mid-century 20th century uh, theologian mm -hmm. very progressive theologian mm -hmm. which used to be the case in mid 20th century theology we had a progressive uh, movement at that time yep. and uh the picture shows a knight on a very sturdy horse, but right alongside him is death with an hourglass with the sands going down on a pale horse. And behind him is the devil. And it just struck me as a metaphor for what it takes to get through life in some way where you fulfill your potential. It's, you, have to, you have to be aware somehow that you know, life is fleeting and it's a miracle and we don't have all day or all, <laughs> all <laughs> Eternal year. eternity. And, right. Even though some and of the billionaires the want that. They want to be, they want to put their consciousness in android bodies and go to the moon. Yeah. Or not yeah. the moon, Mars yeah, yeah. and other exoplanets. Exactly right. And, and behind the knight on this horse is the devil, a horned beast. And I thought of that devil as shame and fear. I feel that what people leave cults with uh, so often is can be boiled down to undue shame and undue fear. They've been made to feel so frightened in the cult. Uh, if they leave, what kind of punishment will they get? How will they... Uh, stand on their own two feet. And they feel so ashamed often of what they've done, what they've allowed themselves to experience, what's been done to them. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to capture for people what it takes to leave the prison of shame and fear mm -hmm. that you're left with when you're traumatized. And this, this goes for people in cults. But I work Primarily, to be honest, with adult children of highly narcissistic parents. Yeah, I want to hear and, more um, about that. Please, yeah, tell and us. that that is a that's as epidemic as cult involvement. Um, unfortunately, many many people experience a kind of um, overt or covert abuse and neglect in as they grow up. Mm -hmm. We, as a culture. Um, are not universally uh, taught what it means to be a parent, what, what childhood development entails. And for many of us, uh, there's a systemic uh, racism and other systemic issues where um, people cannot um, elevate themselves out of their poverty, out of their communities, because there's a system that's set up against them. Yeah. I, I like to call it the, uh, the theocracy, oligarchy, industrial complex. Hmm. We have, um, you know, a sort of a Christianism now, a white, a, a Christo-fascist white nationalism mm -hmm. that is, uh, you know, inherently racist. And then we have the oligarchy, which is inherently uh, a monarch a monarchical kind of system where only those who can you know grab it have power and everybody else is a subject mm -hmm. so our our world sets up a, a way in which many people have to uh break free of shame and fear and and of course um primarily I deal with people who grew up in families that it were traumatizing or in cults and other kinds of groups that were traumatizing. So the book tries to 
talk about the clinical work that I do. Mm-hmm. You mentioned internal family systems. That's been a big influence on me as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've studied other trauma modalities. Neuroscience yep. has now helped us learn a great deal more about trauma and the brain and the nervous system and the body. Yeah, Porges so, uh, and th- Bessel van der Kolk, you know, the body keeps the score. Janina Fisher is a big influence for me. Uh-huh. And, and these people have really opened up the field of trauma and recovery in ways that I think, you know, have been developing since the 90s, but now more than ever are available. And I'll be honest, psychoanalysis has to catch up with the traumatologists. I, I'm speaking about that uh, in some of my public speaking appearances uh, this mm-hmm. year. Um, the integration of trauma theories with the psychoanalytic theories. Mm-hmm. Um, so in my way of working, what I'm really seeing is that people become self-alienated out of these traumatizing experiences, yep. meaning that they they actually feel ashamed of themselves. So a part of them is shaming them, and Mm -hmm. another part is feeling shamed. Um, Self-alienation is the problem Janina Fisher talks about, and it really, to me, captures the essence of what I see in people who uh, who have lost the ability to have compassion for themselves, Mm -hmm. for their traumatized parts, their vulnerable parts, you know, their weak and, and, and hurt parts, their young parts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you're, when you're um, you know, when you leave a cult, and this is, this is what happened for me, I wanted, to, I wanted to look normal. I did not want to look like some stigmatized, weirdo, crazy person who'd been in a cult. <laughs> and so I wanted, to, I wanted sure. to get rid of that. Right? I wanted to get rid of that part of me. Yeah, most people and want to compartmentalize pretended. and stick it in a closet and pretend it never happened. Terrible exactly. strategy long term. And thank goodness I picked up your book, mm. um, that first one. And of course, I've read your others. But that first one just woke me up and said, wait a minute, what am I ashamed of? I, I had good intentions. I was trying to do something good in the world. Mm. Why am I ashamed? And that guru is walking around absolutely shameless. And that guru is a criminal. And that guru is a, a sadistic abuser and, a, and, a, and a, really a parasite. What am I doing holding all the shame? And what am I afraid of? Yeah, and if that I, really was important. Yeah, and I want to say that I, I, I'm, I'm so happy that my book continues to help people. And I think part of why it was successful at, at connecting the dots was that people would pick it up going, oh, the Moonies are a cult. Those people who did mass weddings right. to strangers and would hit each other on the buttocks three times as hard as they could. That Korean billionaire, obvious, you know, right wing fascist. How could any? So they'd read my book and then they'd be like, this is like my story, different Leader, right. different ideology, but the process was the same. And the biggest thing is people realizing I'm not alone. It's not about me. There's this whole phenomenon out there with all these other millions of people. And all of a sudden, yes. you know, oh, it's not my fault. It's a phenomenon yep. of social influence and undue influence. That's right. That's right. I was saddened today to read the uh, article on NPR about the Nixium cult and the second uh, upcoming series of The Vow, because um, it really did not capture or understand. No, the, the author really, I felt, didn't understand the depths to which a person is trapped inside a cult, the depths in which unless you give up entirely any of your own values and ethics and lose your moral compass to follow that leader, you are living uh, in a situation where you feel as though you will be you will have lost everything. Yep. And that that psychological trap that people are in um, 
is very hard to understand. But that's that's so you know. So Steve, the about two, work. the season yeah. two is coming out on HBO, and today the first the first one um, really had a lot of footage from Mark Vicente, who was the filmmaker. So it really, I loved it because it was showing. The journey and what was the attractiveness initially, especially, and then but internal footage of specific manipulations and double binds. And it was very much NLP hypnotic, you know, yeah. manipulation. And the public still doesn't understand hypnosis and that doesn't understand undue influence. And there's this, as you know so well, this unconscious bias to blame the victim you know, it must have been something yeah. in him or her that made them weak. And it's like, no, we're human. And nobody educated yeah. us on what to watch out for. Like, I don't know about you, but I remember my parents and credit cards surfaced. You never give your credit card number to a stranger, especially on the phone, no matter how persuasive they are never give your, I mean, we need that level of education of people but what's tricky now is that we are online mostly and people can gather information about us without even asking us and pretend yes. to be psychic and mystical and know all of our deepest, darkest fears and sins, etc. So there really is this, this, mind, this internet oriented mind control being exerted. In fact, I have a podcast uh, out this morning on Beware the Metaverse um, from one of the top people mm -hmm. in AI who's been tracking this for 50 years. And he said, the data that can be collected on us can then be on yep. scale used to sell us products, to tell us who to vote for, et cetera, where each person's getting a different variation of a story to effectively press our buttons. And yep. that's why I feel it's, it's urgent that people like yourself and myself have a bigger platform to tell everybody, hey, we're intelligent, educated from loving families, Pay attention, this is happening right now. And to call the Absolutely. other stupid or crazy for believing delusions, no, they've been programmed with the delusions. <laughs> it's, it's so easy. It's so easy to be uh, influenced. Uh, and the internet has, you know, television and advertising, of course, uh, you know, became this huge. Uh, influential force, but it, it's it's like a you know it's puny compared to the power of the internet. Yeah, uh, which un which is obviously there's so much good, but there is really so much undue influence. Right, it's scary. I want to I want to use your expertise. So um, if if someone's listening, they had a narcissistic father, let's say. Um, not the horrible kinds, but enough to, um, right. you know, as you point out correctly, neglect is also a form of abuse. It's not just hitting somebody or, or, or yelling at people that, that way. But if, if someone's listening, they had a narcissistic father, they realize this narcissism, but they're still carrying around the burden because they haven't yeah. done that therapy. Walk us through some of the important approaches that you use with them or stories, if you, you know, want to share any. Yes. Um, I, I work in a way that I try to create a relationship that will allow a person to feel safe and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that space discover more about what's happening inside. Mm -hmm. Where is there a lack of self-compassion or self-understanding? Where is there self-contempt? Mm -hmm. That really becomes the essence of the work. Um, when we are abused or neglected, we uh, react to that, mm -hmm. um, but we also internalize it. Mm -hmm. And we, don't, we do both, and the internalization is also is usually unconscious. Mm -hmm. We don't, uh, and it takes the form of self-contempt and the absence of self-compassion. It can also take the form 
of uh, a kind of uh, grandiosity that uh, that some victims can can um, can struggle with, in which they feel entitled to view everybody else as a perpetrator and maintain their own sense of victimization. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a very complex. A way in which I work with people where I, on the one hand, am trying to promote self-compassion, really root out self-contempt, see mm-hmm. it for what it is, and move it, but also become aware of the impact you've had on others as you've been struggling with your own victimization. Mm-hmm. So that that kind of work takes time. It's Part of it is psychoeducational, you know, the intellect, what we learn, what we teach. I I certainly go over the brain and the nervous system triggering and so on. But the other part is harder. And, um, you know, developing that self-compassion, it sounds like, well, yeah, why why shouldn't we be self-compassionate? It's amazing to me how hard that is for most people who Mm. have been traumatized. Mm -hmm. The clinging to the self-loathing or the self-contempt feels somehow as though that's the only way they're going to, you know, ever be able to function. Mm-hmm. And uh, this this is what has uh, surprised me and what I've had to really study and learn more about is mm-hmm. why why after the, after a trauma or a traumatic upbringing or traumatic experience in a cult why would we be divided against ourselves mm-hmm. and have so much difficulty finding self-compassion? And really, it's that, it's that thing I said earlier. When I left the cult, I didn't want anybody to know that I was a schmuck. I didn't want anybody to know what a fool I had been and how wrong and gullible and, and ridiculous. It was so embarrassing. I was so ashamed. And it really took... Uh, you know, it took more than just um, one year and a few books. It took quite a while in therapy mm-hmm. to really release that shame, you know, and mm-hmm. to really be able to find self-compassion. And it's it's key as yeah. I see it. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, the relational thing, can I ask you, do you... Do you think that part of the relational piece is that, in a way, you're reparenting a, a, a client to be like the healthy, loving, you know, father figure? Or, well, I I certainly want my uh, relationship with this person to feel safe and to feel real. And um, I feel it's real, and I want the other person to know that. Mm -hmm. But what I'm really targeting is each individual's innate self-healing capacity. Mm -hmm. That potential for self-healing isn't just like when we cut our finger and it heals. It's also emotional and psychological, and I would say spiritual. Yeah without without re- referencing religion mm-hmm. the capacity for self healing is there within each of us and it's often what's you know lost or or stuck in people and so in my work i keep aiming to try to help people find that capacity for self compassion because that's what's healing mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. how they they bring out their own self-healing. So, uh, compassion allows us to grieve. It allows us to um, have empathy for ourselves and others. Mm-hmm. It allows us to make sense of what made no sense. Right. You know? Yeah, it's great work. So, um, you know, one of my teachers was Daniel Brown, not the one who did the uh, movies and the famous books, the, th- the forensic psychologist who testified for victims of Catholic Church priest abuse, and, uh, et cetera. And he came up with an attachment pr- repair protocol. I don't know if you've heard about it or not, but I find it is remarkably powerful. 
Um, and it resonates with my own approach, which is I don't do long term therapy, unlike yourself. So I'm kind of more psychoeducation oriented and wanting to give people a toolbox for them to feel whole enough to then take control of their own healing journey and such. But his, I'm just going to share for our listeners, Dan Brown would basically teach people to go inside, trance state, uh, back to a childhood traumatic experience, and he would give the instructions, and it's simple, I'm going to give it right now, of imagine you had your ideal mother and your ideal father unique to your personality. What would you have wanted them to say or do? differently. And it's just mm-hmm. inviting people to use their imagination to to use psychodynamic language to create new interjects of mother and father right. who are there all the time and who are giving encouragement and love and specialness. And it doesn't negate what actually happened, the people remember what their actual history was, but it's a tool to rewire, to use neuroscience and neurogenesis, Mm -hmm. neuroplasticity, to develop that inner voice. Dan, you're special. You're you're so unique. You've done such great work. You're such a good dad, good therapist, to bathe us with... Not BS, like real validation right. <laughs> for right. our beingness. Yeah, no, it's it's lovely, uh, and and I, it's uh, kind of related to the internal family systems work, where a person really starts to connect to a, a, a part of themselves. Let's say at a certain age, and when you ask, "Well, how do you feel toward that part?" Mm. Um, very often, the first answer is, "I wish he would leave me alone." I, I'm, I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed, and to to move that to help move that person to be able to have the same compassion for that part of themselves mm. that they would have for any other child. Mm-hmm. I, I often say, you know, you're in the mall. And there's a little six-year-old kid standing there alone crying his eyes out. What do you do? Just kick him as he walks by? Or do you kneel down and say, are you lost? What happened? Tell me. I'll help you. You know, we naturally have compassion. Steve, I saw a video of of a large turtle in a pond on its back flailing. And as the camera watched this... About a dozen turtles from all over the pond all came in, got underneath that turtle, and turned him over. I mean, turtles have the instinct for compassion. Turtles. Elephants, (laughs) too. Elephants will look after each other. It's innate in human beings. And when we cannot find that compassion for ourselves, those traumatized parts... You know, that's that's when we're self-alienated, and that's, that's what I find is most often the result of cult involvement. Yeah, so I want to just highlight for me and my understanding of the approach, there are no bad parts. There are parts right. that may have in, identified with the aggressor for survival purposes right. and adopted the same narcissistic traumatizing strategies for survival most people don't identify with the aggre- you know they use that term identify with the aggressor but um you know I, when i work with with a few people who were in these satanic type cults where they were were involved yeah. with murder uh the question what would have happened if you said no to participate in the ritual Oh, I would have been killed. Oh, so the part of you that participated in that evil act was trying to help you survive. That's not a bad yes. bad motivation. And then, of course, the, I know it. the rewiring. If you could go back in time knowing what you know now, you know, use your imagination. You know, what would you do differently? Because when you were younger, you didn't have the resources you have now. You know, and to try yes. to keep people in the now 
uh, as adults instead of regressing back to these child states that can sometimes take over. Yeah, yeah, I, and really, um, probably only in the last ten years did I start to realize how important it was to understand the trauma research that's been going on the last. 10, 20 years, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I really start to integrate that into my work. Um, yep. And I, I think it's made a huge difference. And I know there are others who, in the cult expert field, mental health uh, uh, people who are also recognize the importance of that kind of trauma, yep. understanding of trauma. And the bottom line is, is we're growing and we're learning and we don't want to get stuck in models from the past. We want to like open ourselves up to the new research and, and reflect on it, try it out, see what happens. And where I've arrived after decades of being a therapist is that you need to have a big toolbox of lots of different models and you need Certainly. to customize for each person what you think they need, what's missing or blocking from moving to the next step and the next step and the next step. And uh, don't make them dependent on you. Just keep empowering them that they can take care of themselves. I think that's a, that, that don't, don't make your patient dependent on you, empower them, might be very specific to those of us who were in cults who, who, uh, who recognize how what a slippery slope that can be. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it's something I've also, I've also been aware of from the get-go. The, the power of the therapist yeah. and how that can be abused. Um, you know, and as you know, there are many people who leave cults that were led by psychotherapists. Yes. So, we're all, we're all, uh, the, and the I heard, awareness. I heard you on an interview with a colleague, Rachel Bernstein, talk about how when you left, you deliberately didn't accept the, the, the therapist from the cult because you knew That's they right. would redirect you to the cult. And I've seen this over and over again, this dual relationship, ethical violation of these therapists. And like how, your yep. obligation is to your client, not to your guru. Always. Yeah, to your it's unfortunately very, very common. And there are many therapists who make themselves a guru. Yes. Um, unfortunately. You know, it's been going on. Listen, this, it's been going on. Uh, you know, it's a tale as old as time, right? Mm. The uh, <laughs> the authoritarian dynamic. Uh, all we can do is um, what we do, you know, help individuals, write books, talk on podcasts, you know. It's great. I really appreciate your work. So as we wrap up, I want to give you the last words. Um, you have two books. I think your first book you told me is out on audio now, and hopefully the yes. second one will too. And I really want to encourage people to come to your website and, and know your work and read your books. But you're, you've got thank the you. last words, buddy. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, I'm really just going to um, offer you my thanks and respect for the work that you've been doing all these years. You kind of led the pack. You got out there in front pretty early on. And it made a huge difference in the in the field. It made a difference in my life. And um, it continues to make a difference. And I know how frustrated all of us are about the political situation. And your effort in that area has been enormous. Mm. And yet, you know, here we are facing elections where we do not know if democracy will survive one more election, frankly, is what we're looking at. So... Um, I really uh, appreciate We're not going to give up, though. Done. At least I'm, I'm not. I'm not giving up. We're going to keep fighting, and, you, and you've been fighting the good fight on that front, and I really appreciate that. And one thing and, that... And, you know, both of my books... Yeah, go ahead. Both of my books have a chapter devoted to politics. Mm. The first one, I came down on the Bush administration and the Iraq war. And the second one, I come down on Trump very, very explicitly. Mm -hmm. And I... You know, Amazon reviewers, uh, I've been very lucky to have great Amazon reviews, but there's always one that resents the mention of the political in a mental health book. Well, the 
the political is our mental health. We live in that sure. world. And if we are in an authoritarian world, our mental health is threatened. Totally. And I guess I'll end there. Fight for democracy. That's that's what that's when I left this cult in 1994 and I saw what was going on with the evangelicals mm -hmm. and I knew something was wrong. And now you just see the. They've aligned with the billionaires and the and the fossil fuel oligarchs, and look at where we're at. We're we're facing the potential loss of American democracy. It's unthinkable. Yeah. So, I do want to I do want to add one last thing that there are lots of evangelicals Please. who despise the seven mountain dominionist Christian nationalists, the people who want Absolutely. prosperity ministers and who claim to have revelations from God. So I'm hoping though, though that population will speak much louder to the people who think I, they're following Jesus and following the Bible and understand that they're, so. they're in cults. I think that, I, I think that the, um, it might be a minority of evangelicals, but that's the problem is that the minority wants to gain enough power to drown out the majority. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, so good luck to all of us. Yes. And thank, thank you. you for your Daniel and Shaw and Daniel Shaw. Um, uh, L what, what's your website again? Uh, Daniel Shaw, LCSW.com. Great. Thank you so much. And best of luck with your books. Thank you, Steve.